Yeah, uh, good evening everyone live on uh, Radio Sofia. Uh, so Radio Sofia is a student initiated platform for interdisciplinary lectures, uh, discussions and debates. And uh, we are really privileged to have with us uh, Professor Shudipto Sarangi joining us from the United States of America to speak on economic and social networks and idiosyncratic introduction. At a time when human interactions have been limited due to the pandemic, we've realized how networks of relationships play central roles in a wide variety of social, economic, and political interactions. And as we head into one of India's most awaited budget after a couple of days, and several of the, of the institutions stand to be vulnerable, network economics provides a useful language to capture how relationship between individuals are essential to economic exchange. And to speak on that and much more, we have uh, Professor Dr. Shudipto Sarangi, who's currently the department head and professor of economics at Virginia Tech. His uh, research interests range uh, from network theory to development economics. He has authored numerous articles in several prestigious journals and also serves on the editorial boards of journals such as the Journal of Economic Behavior and Organization, Economic Bo Modeling and others. His recently authored book titled The Economics of Small Things is one of the best sellers on the Amazon platform where he uses everyday events to lucidly explain complex concepts in economics. Without further ado, we shall begin with today's uh, proceedings on economic and social networks. Over to you, Professor Sarangi. Thank you, Himadri. Thank you uh, for giving me an opportunity to speak. Uh, I always encourage PhD students. I think I've been one and I know how it is. Um, so to start out, I will say at some point, uh, James Buchanan, after he got the Nobel Prize in his retired part, in the retired part of his life, he used to be in my department. And apparently the story is uh, when people would ask James Buchanan, you know, what advice do you have for PhD students and junior faculty members? He had a very simple answer, keep your ass on the chair. Yeah. So, so basically, uh, you know, it doesn't matter how much you know what you do, but if you're not willing to put in the hours, uh, not much will happen. So, so that, you know, with that, I just want you to know, yes, I mean, I, I, I'm very happy to be uh, participating in this and, um, you know, I'm happy to be presenting some of these ideas. The presentation is deliberately kept uh, non-technical. There is a technical part. I don't think we will have time. If you find the non-technical part too easy and too simple, then tell me, we can go to the technical part. Okay. So I, so feel free to tell me that, okay, we know all this. Okay, then we can switch to um, a more formal part of the presentation. So I'm happy to do either one. So with that, let me start sharing the screen and uh, we will get going, okay? If you have questions, feel free to interrupt, uh, but given the time, unless they're clarificatory questions, wait till the end, okay? That's what I would suggest. All right. So thank you, Radio Sophia, for having me. So what are networks? Well, it's a very simple way to think about networks. Networks define the interaction structure between agents. So it can be, actually, it can be agents. It can be countries. It can be organizations. It can be computers, right? So whatever defines the interaction structure, this is different from the idea of a market because we don't need to define the interaction structure in the market. Uh, this is also different from a coalition where we don't focus on the group. We, we, uh, or we don't focus on individuals, we focus on what the group does. What a network does is very importantly, it defines the bilateral interaction structure between agents, right? So how A interact, does A interact with B? Does B interact with A? Or maybe A and B don't interact. We can also think of a situation where uh, a network, which is a network of web page visits, right? So then A interacts with B, but B does not interact with A. So typically the agents in the network are represented by nodes or vertices of a graph. And then the relationship between them is represented by links. And of course, in graph theoretic terms, those will be vertices and edges, right? 
Uh, networks are a very useful visualization tool. You know, there's all this big data stuff, uh, all this emphasis on visualization. Networks are a very useful tool for visualizing things. This is a very uh, interesting visualization of the network of terrorists in 9-11. Okay, they were all involved in different uh, incidents on 9-11, the color shows, um, you know, which flights they were on, the thickness of the lines matters. So I will talk about it a little bit later. So this was done by a journalist called Krebs in 2002. Uh, this is a trade network, right? So you can see um, that the color uh, is uh, talking about the volume of trade. Um, and then the, uh, you know, the number of connections. So for example, if you look at Kazakhstan here, their major trading partner, sort of any trading partner is Russia, okay? They do very little with anybody else. It's kind of center of the world global trade network is United States, Mexico is right there, Canada is right there, immediate neighbors, China is, uh, Japan is here, China is, uh, China is here. Uh, this is China, right? And uh, no, this, sorry, this is China and this is Japan. Obviously, this was in 2008, things would be very different now. China would be probably the biggest trading partner and so on. So this is, again, you know, a lot of information can be encapsulated in a network like this, but you could also have uh, multi-layered networks, right? So you could have, um, you know, you could have uh, within each layer there is networks and then some of the nodes or some of the agents are connected across graphs. So for example, we're thinking, we, I'm doing some work now on multiple graphs, which you could, think that there is a network of professional relationships and there is a network of uh, personal relationships. So this could be, for example, professional and this could be personal or social. And then there are some agents who are common to both networks who are linked across both networks, right? So the, inter the intersection set of agents could be the ones that are connecting these layers of the network, okay? Uh, this is a very uh, interesting network again. This is a classic network that is used in Matt Jackson's test book, uh, textbook on networks. This is the number of families that were um, ruling Florence, right? So in the 1400s, there were 16 families that were basically ruling uh, Florence and those are the 16 families. And what is very interesting is that at this point when this picture was taken, uh, the Medici, who are of course now very famous, um, did not, were not an influential family, okay? And around this early 1400s, Cosimo di Medici becomes the head of the Medici clan. And what does Cosimo di Medici do? He sets about creating marriage alliances. So this network actually shows the marriage alliances that Cosimo di Medici created, okay? And then we will see through this network, we can immediately see why the Medici became important. So this is uh, relying on the work of two scholars called Ansel and Paget. It turns out the Medici had the highest number of marriage alliances. That is, they had six marriage alliances. In other words, if you look at the things extending from the Medici, there are six of them. One, two, three, four, five, six, okay? So that's what Cosimo di Medici did for the Medici. He created 16 marriage alliances. What does that do for the Medici? Well, it changes their betweenness dramatically. What is betweenness? Betweenness measures how many parts connecting other families go through a particular family, okay? So imagine that PIJ is the number of shortest parts connecting family I to family J, okay? And then let's put the subscript K there, okay? So, so if K equal to Medici, then we will say that's the number of shortest parts connecting two different Italian families that go through the Medici. So P Medici would measure that. So if I were to look at the shortest path between the Barbadori and the Guardagni families in that graph, it turns out that the Medici are on two of them. Barbadori Medici, Albizzi, Guardagni, Barbadori Medici, Turnabuni, and Guardagni, okay? So the Medici are present on two of those different paths that connect the Barbadori to Guardagni. Of course, it could be possible that they are, those are the only two paths that connect the Barbadori and the Guardagni. Now, when we extend this idea to the entire network, okay, then this gives us a sense of power in the, of a family in the network. What is this? This is a measure of the total number of links in a given network. This is very easy to see, right? Because everybody can only make n minus one links. And then if you already made a link with one person, they can only connect to the other n minus two people. And since 
you know, the links can be made both ways. We divide by two. This is the measure of the total number of links in an undirected network. This is the total number of links between two families and PKJ measures the number that goes through a particular family. So once I do this, I can get a measure of importance of that family. This is betweenness centrality. It turns out that the Medici has a betweenness centrality of 0.522, which is the highest. And look at the second highest. The second highest is 0.255. That means in some sense, the Medici are a hundred times more important than the second most important family out of those 16 families in connecting everybody in this group, okay? So the Guadagni have a betweenness centrality measure of 0.255, whereas the Medici have a measure of 0.522. So why is this important? Well, this is what I'm saying here. The extent that managed relationships are important for gathering information, brokering business deals, reaching political decisions, the Medici are way better positioned than all the other families. The second highest family in terms of influence is only half as influential as the Medici. This is also which explains, you know, in, in, in times when kings ruled the earth, marriage alliances were very important, right? So we know Akbar had many wives because they were important part of his marriage alliance. Uh, and his marriage alli these, these wives went across religion because he wanted uh, marriage alliances across religions, right? So, so we see the importance of alliances everywhere. Now, this is a, a very funny um, example. So this is an example of football rivalry. So I'm talking about American football, first of all. And this is a measure of rivalry within conference. So what does this mean? You know, in, in, in America, uh, universities um, are regionally organized into conferences. So this is this Pac-10 is, is a set of schools that is on the Pacific coast. That's why it's called Pac-10, okay? SEC is called the Southeastern Conference, right? So these are universities that are on the West Coast. These are universities mostly in the South. And uh, what, does, what information does this capture? This captures the information that fans belonging to these teams were asked the question, who within your conference is your biggest rival? Okay, now the SEC, the Southern teams are typically very, very strong teams. There are a number of teams in the South, South that have done very well in college football in America. So there is Alabama, which has been champion the largest number of times. Uh, Arkansas is very good. Florida is very good. Georgia is very good. Auburn is good. LSU is good. Ole Miss is good. Okay, so you can see the thickness of lines is much stronger in the SEC than in the Pac-10. In the Pac-10, what you see interestingly is that uh, Stanford and California are rivals, Oregon and Oregon State are rivals, Arizona and Arizona State are rivals, right? But they don't care much about the other teams. So when you have a lot of good teams, there's a lot of rivalry and it is directed against each other. But we also find that rivalries tend to be localized. So teams within a particular region tend to have stronger rivalrous feelings towards each other. So this just captures the sense of which team hates which team. Okay? And you can clearly see that this, the SEC conference, this conference has many more stronger teams because the incidence of rivalry is very high. So we can use the idea of a clustering coefficient that can look at what happens uh, to rivalry and the higher the clustering coefficient, then we know that there is more rivalry there. What's the clustering coefficient? Basically, it's a measure of how tightly connected the network is. One way to think about it is if A and B are friends and B and C are friends, how likely is that A and C are friends? Okay, that's a clustering coefficient. Again, I mean, till now I've been explaining visualization. Now I want to focus on why networks are important because if I have a given network, I can try to find out who is important. And once I know who's important, if I want to create a marketing campaign, if I want to have a policy, if I want to diffuse an idea, these are very important. For example, of course, you know, many of you might know that among mathematicians, there is this measure called the Erdos measure, right? So how many degrees away are you from um, a mathematician that has written a paper with Paul Erdos? Right? So that's called um, the Erdos number, right? So centrality is a way to look at the importance of nodes. And this is very useful. 
uh, forget about how it is measured. Uh, so forget about the formal definition. Uh, what I want to focus on is that there are many different ways to measure centrality, okay? Degree centrality, which is what I already mentioned. Uh, we showed um, earlier uh, that the Medici have a degree centrality of six, okay? So this looks at who's the most connected. So in other words, who should you talk to? Who can help you? You can look at closeness centrality, how close a person is to everybody else. So how easily can a particular node reach other nodes? Okay. So uh, the node that can reach the largest number of other people is a measure of, uh, provides you closeness centrality. So this is very important in terms of locally who is influential. You can also think of between the centrality, which we already explained, which is how many parts connecting different nodes go through a certain node, okay? So this is the node that keeps the network connected, right? So removing this node is going to change connectivity in the network. So these people, you can think of these, this type of measure as something that can be used to see who can move things uh, in, an, in a network uh, more efficiently. So. I will not go into this, but if, if, I, if I take you with this link, uh, if you go to Repec, you can type my name and I can type any, any other economist's name and you can see uh, my betweenness centrality um, to that person. But I think given the time limits, we will not do this exercise, okay? So I want to go back to the 9-11 um, network and show you how these different centrality measures can be important. So first of all, the thing to observe about this network is that this is a very hard network to take down. There are at least six nodes uh, and you will, have to, you will have to take down at least six nodes before you can do significant damage to this network, which essentially suggests that this is a very modular network, okay? It will stay intact, which is the, you know, obviously that's the efficient way of organizing terrorist cells. Uh, there will be maybe a few people that are connected to everybody, but a lot of those other people will only be connected to each other. So if you take one part of the network out, it's not going to affect other parts of the network, okay? So if you look at degree betweenness and closeness, it turns out that Muhammad Atta, who was called the mastermind behind all of this, is the highest on all three measures. And so it's not a surprise that more people used to say that Muhammad Atta was the mastermind behind the 9-11 attacks. And then there's this person called al Shahid, comes in close because he's high. He's number two because he comes in uh, high on degree and closeness. However, I want to point out that there is an alternative hypothesis. There's another uh, person called Al-Hazmi, okay? He comes second in betweenness, which means that he exercised a lot of control because betweenness means he was connecting everybody else, but fourth in activity and seventh in closeness, right? Now, what is interesting is that if you eliminate the thinnest links, which were the most recent links, are the, in, in other words, these are people who are not being used till the very last minute. If you eliminate those links because they were not really involved in the planning process, it certainly turns out that Al-Hazmi is the most powerful node, okay? He comes out for both important both in control and access and only second to Atta in degree. So the alternative hypothesis that has been developed by some, and it's kind of hard to verify this, is that maybe we were wrong to think of Muhammad Atta as the mastermind. Maybe the key mastermind was Al Hazmi. Okay. Now we can think of other types of measures of centrality in a network, which is whether centrality. So these centrality, the first set of centrality measures, all have to do with the node, okay, on a particular node. But a centrality measure can also be based on your neighbor's characteristics. Okay, so who you are connected to, how important those people are. So one such idea is the idea of Bonnetsit centrality. Bonnetsit centrality essentially or very intuitively, what it says is that the centrality of a node depends on the centrality of the nodes this node is connected to. So one way to measure Bonnetsit centrality or the simplest way to measure Bonnetsit centrality is take the network and measure all the paths starting from one person to everybody else in the network, okay? All the paths and add them up, that number gives you the centrality of that person. Do this for all the nodes, and then you get the centrality for every other, everyone in the network. Uh, so it's, it's, it was developed by a sociologist called Phil Bonasich, and you know, 
but goes back to work by another person called Katz in the 1950s. So sometimes it's called the Katz point of system charity. Yeah. Do you have a question? So it's used to measure influence and power. Is there a question there? Uh, no, sir. So you can continue. Okay. Uh, so now I want to talk about a measure that economists use a lot. This was uh, presented in a paper by <clears throat> by Tony Kalvar, Mengol, Yves Zenu, and Coralio Balester in Econometrica in 2006. Uh, so I want to write down a utility function, and I'm going to explain this utility function to everybody, and then work through this. So think of sigma ii as negative, okay? And so this is your own effort in the network. So this first term is used to measure concavity of effort. In other words, you, you, your, your utility increases with your effort, but at a decreasing rate, okay? This is the kind of function this will give you. All right, alpha is a constant, uh, sigma i is a constant. Essentially, you could write it as xi minus half xi squared. Okay? Because when you take the first order condition, then what you will get is a linear representation. This is very important. Now, this is the utility from interacting in the network. So this value, sigma ij, if you are connected, then sigma ij is equal to one. If you're not connected, sigma ij equal to zero. That means the rest of the terms will go away. If you are connected, then we have what is called strategic complementarity. That means if I am connected to, if i is connected to j, then their utility is the effort put in by i into the network times the effort put in by j into the network. Okay, multiplied by this weighting factor. And there is usually an extra term outside lambda, which makes it very small to ensure that this does not blow up and destroy the concavity. Remember when we're dealing with mathematical properties, if we need an interior optimum, we need the overall function to be concave. So these, the, the, the benefits from interacting in the network with, from everybody are captured by this term, okay? So Ballester, Kalba, Mengol, Zenu started out with a utility function like this, and they wanted to look at what is the Nash equilibrium effort level in this game. And why is this paper beautiful? This, or, and why is it in Econometrica? Because this paper does something very interesting. This paper shows that the optimal Nash equilibrium effort level is proportional to Ponatzit centrality. Why is this nice result? This is a nice result because I don't need to know what the effort levels are. I don't really need to know the utility function. As long as I can assume that the utility function is has this kind of linear quadratic form, then I can tell you that you give me the graph and I will tell you what the effort level of each player will be. Because if you just give me the graph, I can calculate the monoxide centrality. And from that, I, since they show that the equilibrium effort level of every individual is proportional to their monoxide centrality, all I have to do is compute the monoxide centrality of these players and say, this is how these people will put in effort, okay? But they also compute another measure of importance in the network, which is called an intercentrality measure. And this is a measure that economists like a lot because it works in the following way. It says, take out one person from the network. If I take out this person, their effort is gone. And therefore all the effort that they put in, in the network to work with others is gone, okay? So if I take out a person, it reduces everyone else's effort. The most important player in a team is the person or in a network is the person whose removal reduces everybody else's effort by the maximal amount, okay? So then I can rank all of them by removing them. So it's like saying, okay, if I remove, if I take a basketball team or a football team and I say, I remove one player at a time and see how the performance of the rest of the team would be affected. And the most important player is the one whose performance will affect the rest of the team by the maximal amount. That's called an intercentrality measure. So starting networks, Okay, what do we do here? Well, networks can be used to study data, which is happening a lot now. And as Himadri said, diseases, we're in the midst of a pandemic, trade networks, I told you, favors, who do you help, right? So this very interesting paper, for example, about how people share river water, because river only flows downstream, right? So families in Pakistan share river water for irrigation through a complex trade of favors so that people both living upstream and downstream can, do, and can share the river water by doing favors for each other. 
as mm -hmm. influence associations all of that. Um, network models can be used to explain how these flows take place. They are of course interdisciplinary. Mathematicians, you know, it goes back to the bridges of Königsberg, Euler, sociologists, physicists, biologists, um, computer science, anthropology, operations research, supply chain, and stuff, and and sort of. Recently, more recently, economics. I would say um, people, uh, economists, started working on these topics uh, in sort of a more vigorous way since around 1995, somewhere around that time. What does economics bring to the table? Well, interesting thing that economics brings to the table in the study of networks is that unlike most of the other disciplines that I've talked about, economists ask the question: How do these networks form? So most of those other disciplines will take the network as given. They either do something on top of the given network or they will analyze properties of the network. But nobody, none of those people are asking how these networks formed. Economists start to ask the question of how networks form. How do we get there, okay? And then the other question economists like to ask is, well, okay, why do we form networks? Because networks give us benefits. But of course, forming networks is not, uh, inexpensive, forming links or relationships with other people is expensive. That's the reason we have a limited number of networks. So if that's the case that benefits, we get a certain amount of benefits, we incur a certain amount of costs, why do specific networks arise? What kind of networks will they arise, right? And then of course, economists try to explain, use, um, you know, use these tools to explain all kinds of things like jobs, favor exchange, flow of information, uh, firm behavior. So, for example, you can imagine that firms engage in R and D collaboration with each other. This is very common, for example, in the auto in, uh, in the uh, automobile industry. Different companies that compete with each other might actually be doing joint R and D, but at the same time, they'll take the joint R and D, produce their own cars, and compete with each other. Okay. So, how? So, what drives the formation of those R and D collaborations? These are the kinds of questions that economists answer. What about uh, sort of an idiosyncratic history? Okay, so I'm going to give you a brief history, but it's idiosyncratic. Everybody know, knows this uh, Bridges of Königsberg problem, right? So we've all played this as a child. Uh, you know, you have the dots. Uh, you, so this is about the stories. In, um, this is about the bridges in the city of Königsberg. You have to traverse all the bridges without retracing your path. So seven bridges of Königsberg. So Euler basically <clears throat> changed the landmass to nodes and then the bridges to paths connecting them. And he's supposed to have created graph theory that way. So in some sense, this is the beginning of network theory. Then um, in the late 1800s, um, so sociologists played a very important role because they introduced the idea of in-groups, out-groups, uh, relationships, connections in, in different groups of society. Mm, so, Emil Durkheim, Ferdinand uh, Tonis, um, Gemeinschaft, Gesellschaft, these kinds of ideas. There were major developments in sociology, psychology, mathematics, anthropology in the 1930s. I mean, economists were not doing any work in these. So I'll give you a flavor of the kind of things that people were doing. There's the famous Stanley Milgram experiment. Stanley Milgram was a professor at Harvard who basically um, gave some envelopes to a bunch of farmers in Nebraska and Kansas, I believe, and said, you know, I want you to send these envelopes to a stockbroker in Boston. You don't know this person and understand that, but send it to the person who you think is likely to know this person, okay? Um, <clears throat> it turns out that on average, uh, it took six, it's like a chain email that we get, right? Everybody is familiar with chain emails these days. So it's exactly the idea of a chain email. So they were told to forward it to who, send it to whoever they knew, and that person had explicit instructions to do the same. Send it to the person you think most likely knows this broker. So Milgram found that on average, it took six steps to get to the stockbroker in Boston. The response rate was not very high. By today's standards, we would consider it very low. So it was a response rate of about 20, 20%. Uh, and on average, it took six degrees of separation. Of course, a, there was a play by John Guare with that name. And there's a movie with Will Smith called Six Degrees of Separation. I think uh, Donald Sutherland, Will Smith, it's a nice movie. Then there was this whole idea of uh, the Oracle of Kevin Bacon. So there was a there was an undergraduate student at the University of Virginia who thought that he was a big fan of Kevin Bacon, and he thought that Kevin Bacon must be the is the most important actor in Hollywood. So he created this database 
where you could type in Kevin Bacon's name, right? And then see how many links it took between, existed between uh, steps it took to reach from Kevin Bacon to any other actor in Hollywood because he thought Kevin Bacon was the center of Hollywood. Well, it turns out he was wrong. Uh, number one was Rod Steger who was in Jaws and then two and three were Pawn Stars. Uh, Kevin Bacon was actually number six. But, and, and you know, you can realize that this measure will keep changing as more, new, more and more movies are made. Unlike, um, unlike um, the Erdos number, because Paul Erdos is dead. Of course, people with Erdos number one are not dead. So people who have Erdos number greater than one, their Erdos number can change, but not people with Erdos number one. Then there's uh, famous papers by Mark Renovetta, which uh, you know, introduces the idea of uh, structural holes, uh, the strength of weak ties, so the strength of weak ties was a very influential paper in sociology. Uh, Granovetter went to blue collar neighborhoods in Boston and he tried to find out how people get information about new jobs, right? So uh, trying to find out how blue collar workers learned about new jobs. Turns out that you don't learn about new jobs from your closest friends. You basically all go to work and go to the same bar at the end of the day. You don't have new information. You get new information from acquaintances. So that's the sense in which Granovetter argues that weak ties are very, very important because these are not your closest friends. Those are your strong ties. The weak ties are the people you meet infrequently. They're your acquaintances, but new information comes to us from the weak ties. And then there was a, a mathematician called Frank Harari um, who has a wonderful book on uh, graph theory, directed graph theory, who looked at a lot of issues um, in modeling networks. If you want to get into this literature, you can find his textbook. It's a fascinating textbook. I recommend it very strongly. In, then in the 50s and 60s, we hear about the emergence of this idea of ran, uh, random graphs. This is the work of Paul Erdos and Rennie Filberry. Um, basically what we do is we have a specific set of nodes and then there's an exogenous given probability P of a link arising randomly between any two nodes. Right? So these are independent draws. So every link can arise randomly and independently um, between any two nodes. And then we look at the realization. This is a random, random graph. There is no bias. Um, these models were very popular in the social network analysis. And uh, sociologists use a lot of these models to understand reciprocity, homophily, popularity, and things like that. But then in the late 90s, uh, Watson Strogatz wrote this paper which changed things quite a bit, this whole idea that the world is a small place. It's called the small world's paper, right? Um, so what the small world's paper said is that, you know, after all, our links are not so random. So in order to do that, what they said is, let's take Erdos and Rennie random graphs, but let's randomly rewire a small proportion of the nodes. So we have a completely random graph, but we will replace some of the random links, okay? Uh, and then make some deliberate connections ourselves. It turns out that just by doing this thing, okay, suddenly the distance within the graph shrinks and everybody is connected to everybody else. So one way to think about it is, you know, I may have um, a lot of connections in India, India and US, but suddenly if you break some of my connections in US or India and start connecting me to randomly to people in Australia, what will happen? the overall distance between people in the network is going to shrink because now, because I'm connected to somebody in Australia, my connection to people in Australia will shrink. And since those people will be connected better in that part of the world, we will have this, okay? Um, of course, as P gets large, we will end up with a random network, okay? So what are small world properties? High clustering coefficient, the path length in the network must decrease. So small average path lengths. And small world networks, believe it or not, are abundant in the real world. Uh, roadmaps are small world networks. Power grids are small world networks. The network of brain neurons is a small world. Telephone call graphs are small worlds. The network of economists, this all, who have published papers, is a small world network. Uh, and one of the things that people talk about is that small world networks follow the power law distribution. They're scale-free. Essentially, the idea is that there is going to be what, what is scale-free power law distribution? Well, all these ideas tell you the following simple thing. The few nodes will have a lot of connections and then everybody else will be in the long tail 
or they will have few connections. And this arises, you can imagine, because of a notion that um, uh, uh, Barabasi and uh, Al Barabasi and Albert, um, Laszlo Barabasi and Albert, I forget Albert's first name, uh, 1999, they introduced this model of preferential attachment. So this, is, this, and I want to point out that this is typically how non-economists would think. They will introduce some nodes to have preferential attachment. That is, everybody wants to link to those. Economists will ask the questions, why do we have a preferential attachment or why do we have a preferential treatment for a certain number of nodes, okay? It's very easy to see the intuition why preferential attachment arises. Early movers, for example, will tend to have preferential attachment. So think about the idea that you are one of the first people to create a search engine like Google. What happens? Everybody will link to Google on their web page, but Google doesn't need to all, you know, need to link to all the thousands of web pages around the world, okay? That's what drives this. However, when we are thinking about these things, I would like to think of a word of caution, okay? We need to separate between correlation and causality. And I'm gonna talk about this paper, which was published in EPW in 2012. So this paper uses corporate board data from the top thousand Indian companies. And then it argues that corporate boards are a small world. It is an old boys network dominated by upper castes, okay? <clears throat> uh, I will argue that it's not necessarily clear to me that this is a deliberate uh, design to create an upper caste network. We have to rule out alternative explanations in order to come to that conclusion. We have to show intent to make that. Why? We already know that education in India is dominated by upper castes, okay? Not only that, this is definitely true for elite institutions. Most of the people in these boards are from these elite institutions. In fact, I'm going to suggest if you do an alternative hypothesis, which says that the these corporate boards are dominated by people from elite institutions, drop their caste, okay? I would like to see if that explanation holds because it's entirely possible that that explanation also holds. Then you would need to do something else to argue that it is a caste-driven small world and not an elite institution-driven small world. So I am saying, that I don't know if this might, their claim might be true, but to me, the problem is they do not rule out the alternative hypothesis. Okay, so we have to be very, very careful when trying to make causal claims about things. Okay, so what do economists do when we study networks formally? What is the architecture of stable networks? What is the architecture of networks that are socially efficient? Stable meaning equilibrium, socially efficient meaning, once that makes society better off. Then of course, do these architectures always coincide? If not, why not? Can we find conditions under which they will coincide? Then we can ask a very, very technical question. Do stable networks always exist, right? So the way people would ask, or mathematicians would ask, these are existence questions. So, so the question here is, do pure strategy equilibria always exist? Okay, because remember, uh, Nash's theorem says every game has an equilibrium, at least in mixed strategies. However, the network's literature doesn't cannot rely on mixed strategy because that would be saying something like, I have a relationship with you in a probabilistic sense. You either are somebody's friend or you're not their friend. You're not a friend in a probabilistic sense, which means you cannot use mixed strategies. You have to use pure strategies, which makes the existence question really difficult one. Okay, then of course, economists go to um, applications. There is the cooperative game theory approach, which is actually much older, which already started in the 70s, but not a lot of work was done. In the cooperative game theory approach, people form uh, networks just like coalitions, but the value function or the output of the game is split only according to the network structure permitted. Here, we do not talk explicitly about strategies as in any cooperative game. Um, and we use variations of things like shapely values. The non-cooperative uh, networks approach, which was pioneered by two papers by Sanjeev uh, Goel and Venkatesh Bala in 2000. And then the idea, so national networks uses as equilibrium concept, the notion of a national equilibrium that is keeping everybody else's strategy. You do not wish to deviate. Pairwise stability was an idea introduced by Jackson Wolinsky, but I will stop here. I will not go into that to ask questions, to take questions, okay? Because otherwise we're gonna run out of time.
Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Sarangi, for a very uh, engaging uh, discussion. I mean, uh, probably many of us are, I mean, at least uh, in IIM Calcutta, very new to this uh, subject. Uh, I'll invite people to have questions of their own, but before they ask, uh, I mean, uh, this is also very new to me. So I'll kind of ask you some I mean, basic questions, which might, might actually sound very naive. Uh, I mean, the, uh, the topic uh, of this uh, of your session is like uh, economic and social networks and idiosyncratic introduction. Uh, I, I per se just wanted to understand, uh, would, you, would you say that these economic networks are a kind of a special form of uh, social networks? Or, I mean, uh, I found, find the distinction a bit blurred. Okay, so, so I think um, people tend to make the distinction because on one hand, you can be studying a purely economic phenomenon like buyer-seller networks. So you can, if you can think about buyer-seller networks, what will happen is that the connections between the buyers and the sellers will affect bargaining power and things like that. You can think of supply chain networks where you know these are purely economic phenomena. The reason we also think about social networks sometimes is because these networks can also determine things like social capital. Okay, so so in some so okay, one way to think about this is many of the development applications for us that we as Indians are very familiar with and like to work on. Some people would put them in the realm of social networks. Uh, and things that relate to social capital and so on would be put in the realm of social networks. Whereas if I'm thinking purely about R&D networks between firms, if I'm thinking of supply chain networks, those, or if I'm thinking about a uh, network of, uh, you know, network of uh, transactions between uh, computer terminals that are processing economic information, that would be a purely economic network. There's no human element in those. Um, where the social one captures the human side. So favor exchange is probably social capital, favor exchange, helping each other, mutual health networks. These are all, uh, in my mind, social networks. So that's typically how the literature has tended to think of these things. Right, right. Uh, you, you also talked about uh, nodes at the uh, edges while you were uh, talking about uh, networks. So uh, from, an, uh, from the perspective of economic networks, uh, what would be the kind of nodes and edges you are uh, referring to? So, you know, so in an economic network, you can, if you're mapping the world trade network, the nodes can be countries. Right? If you're thinking of a treaty, climate change treaty, who wants to contribute, who wants to participate? Again, we can think of um, countries. But if I'm thinking about uh, OPEC, right? Uh, again, you, you can think of countries, but if, if you want to think of uh, dairy farms they, or, or, or a bunch of dairy cooperatives, okay, or a bunch of small producers who sell their handicrafts through a cooperative, these are small producers. You can also think about firms, um, something like the National Association of Tea Growers. And these can be firms. Um, you can also think about just individuals, right? So I can think of the network of friends. So there's a very well-known data set that people use a lot for the research. It's called the Ad Health data set. That is uh, a network of high school students um, in the US who their friends are and who they're connected to. So these are individuals. So it really depends. The unit of analysis can be anything. It can be, you know, you can think of a network of NGOs. Right. Or you can think of a network of servers. And uh, I mean, uh, we've had very limited uh, exposure to uh, what is called uh, this spatial econometrics uh, framework. So is it somewhere linked? I mean, uh, the concept of networks and uh, the spatial econometrics part of it? Okay. Yes. So, so I will first of all say at the very beginning that I don't know much about econometrics. Okay. Uh, however, um, you know, networks also, and one of, one of the important things that people study in the networks literature is peer effects, right? So how peers get together and affect each other, 
Now, the big question in the peer effect literature is how are peers formed? Do I hang out with a group of people that smoke and start smoking? Or we hang out together because we were already smoking, okay? So to answer these types of questions, people look at peer effects, but to establish causality, one of the techniques people use is spatial econometrics. I don't know the details. I have a colleague who actually studies these things. She is a spatial econometrician and um, she, uh, she uses these types of techniques to tease out peer effects. So uh, her name is Julian, and then there is also another person at Cornell called uh, Eleonora Patakini, who has done a lot of work on teasing out peer effects, but not all her work is uh, using spatial econometrics. Julian's work is mostly spatial econometrics. Right, I, right. I can't say more than that. Right, so I mean, uh, for someone who's kind of uh, starting off in this field, uh, like, uh, how, would you uh, recommend certain uh, papers that we should uh, yes. say? Yeah, so, so you know, Matt Jackson teaches a course on Coursera. Okay. That's pretty good. Uh, then um, there is a book by Easley and Kleinberg. Okay, David Easley and John Kleinberg uh, called Markets, Crowds and something. I believe a free copy of that book used to be available on uh, Easley's website or Kleinberg's website, free PDF version, before it was published. I think it's still floating around. You can find that book. That, I think, is an excellent introduction. Okay, It's not super technical. It's not super informal. To get uh, sort of uh, you know introductory ideas, there was a book by, um, there are books by uh, Barabasi. There is a book by, so Matt Jackson has recently written a book called Human Connections. I strongly recommend that. That's easy to read. Um, then Duncan Watts has a book also. Uh, I forget what it is called. Uh, so Jackson's book is called Human Networks, I think. Uh, I forget what um, Duncan Watts book is called, but again, you know, these are all sort of popular introductions. But if you look, are looking for something a little more like a textbook, I would go for Easley Kleinberg. Okay. Okay. If you're looking for introduction to ideas, you can read any of these popular books. Like if you search for Jackson's book on Amazon, then it will also suggest you other books, the book by Barabasi, the book by Watson Strogatz and so on. But yeah, Kleinberg, Easley Kleinberg, which should be freely downloadable. Right, right, right. Uh, I'll ask the audience if they have any questions. Uh, yeah, uh, can I ask something? Yeah. Yes, who yeah. is this? Please introduce yourself and uh, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hi, uh, sir. Uh, Shoham here. I am from the MIS department here, the information systems department here. Mm -hmm. So here uh, we use the social network analysis mostly for analytics applications here. Uh, there's one professor here who works on that. Uh, so my perspective is a little different in the sense that, you know, the uh, measures you mentioned, centrality and all these, these are what we do uh, with the network after it has been formed. So I found that point very interesting is that how do these networks form? Is something economists would like to approach. So uh, I, uh, I'm, forgive me if I missed out on that, if you went into detail on that, but uh, uh, I believe that goes somewhat into behavioral theory, something like that. Not necessarily. So, 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 you know, so I want to clarify something here. Behavioral economics is a recent emergence. What does behavioral economics do? Behavioral economics says that, look, standard neoclassical models assume that people are always rational and they're always maximizing utility. Behavioral economics argues that that's not always the case. We are affected by things like jealousy, anger, moods. So behavioral economics actually tries to construct models of rational behavior that's incorporating these elements into that. We can build models of networks that are not necessarily behavioral, but we can also add behavioral elements to them, right? So one way to think about a behavioral element, for example, could be while, so there are 24 hours in a day. While there may be um, a cost to connecting to people, one behavioral argument could be that, you know, I find it easier to connect to Indians, okay? That will automatically generate preferential attachment if you think about it. Yes. If it's cheaper for me to connect to an Indian than, let's say, to an Australian, 
then it will automatically drive preferential attachments. And suddenly, when I look at the network, I will see a segregated network. Indians are more connected to Indians. Australians are more connected to Australians. Okay, So that's a behavioral element we built in through the cost function. Okay. But that does not have to be the case. We can say it costs the same to connect to an Indian or an Australian. Yeah. Right. So I... Uh... I mean, in my limited experience, networks, we don't really add this behavioral element. So it might be, uh, I, I don't know if there are existing papers on this, but it might be an interesting point. What happens when you change the assumptions of a model? Yeah, so there are papers doing these kinds of things, but I think we have to be very careful about where we do that. We don't have to always do it if we need to do it. If there is a phenomenon we see around us and we, where we tend to think, okay, the behavioral element, is, the standard model is missing out a behavioral element, which is very important. Then we think about incorporating behavioral elements. So more generally, what I'm trying to argue is that, yes, it is true, but we, I mean, the way we want to model things is first look at stories around us, you know, uh, and, and look at data and stories around us and then say, okay, based on this, what should be the right model, right? Um, that's how it, really how behavioral economics came about, that it looked at data generated by standard models and said, standard model is not able to explain this data. They are missing something. So, so you're right that there are instances where we need a behavioral model. There may be instances where we don't, but yeah, okay. you, you have to focus on your circumstances. Right, right. Uh, so, Anyone else who's got a question? Yeah, uh, so yeah, Professor, this is Lulit, uh, from MIS department again. Uh, so uh, my question is, uh, can we use uh, this, this type of methodology in qualitative research and do you have any means uh, inputs means to guide us that, yeah, you can use it in qualitative research in this manner or something like that? Uh, yeah, I, absolutely. Why not? I mean, if you look at the, okay, to do this, to, whether you want to use it for qualitative or quantitative research, that's not the issue. You have to map out the structure of the network. If you don't map out the network structure, then how do you know what you're talking about, right? So, so if you look at the, uh, about the story that we talked about the Medici, okay? It was documented by two political scientists in Chicago, and it's a purely qualitative story. Because what they did is they didn't even measure all these centralities. What they showed is that as the Medici created more marriage alliances, they showed that the Medici, increase, Medici were able to increase their wealth and also their position in the society of Florence. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. in some, some ways, we would not call this quantitative research. It's, it's got some elements of quantity. Basically, they dug into historical records to trace the evolution of the different families, but it yeah. is qualitative research. Yeah. But what you do need to have is you need to have the network, right? Otherwise, how are you going to make a claim? If you're going to say, well, there exists a network in the village, okay, but if you don't know anything about the network, you cannot make any claims. Yeah. So if you want to get an idea, you should read the Ansel and Paget paper. You can find the original paper, I think you can find online. I mean, they have books also. Uh, okay. I think Paget has a book which talks about these ideas, but you can find the original paper. It's short and you can read it. Sure, sir. I'll do that. Yeah. In fact, another very interesting piece of work which was done by sociologists on social network analysis, after Hurricane Katrina, they showed that the Vietnamese community was able to recover fast, fastest in Louisiana because they have very strong church groups. Okay, so the social ties created through the church are very strong. So they helped each other the most and were able to recover the fastest. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'll surely look at it. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, anyone else with any questions? Uh, I don't think uh, we have any more questions. Uh, anyway, sir, Professor Sarangi, uh, it's been great uh, listening to you and uh, your session. I hope uh, many of us would actually read more about it and maybe attend a few online lectures on the same. And uh, thank you for agreeing to take this session. And we look forward to having you in our campus uh, when this COVID thing recedes. 
I hope so. I uh, have to say, I you know, I've been to presidency. I've been to ISI. Uh, I have not been to I am Calcutta campus. I know it's in Joka. I've never been there. I've been to Jadavpur. I've been to presidency. I've been to uh, so basically, I've been to all the other uh, major institutions in Calcutta except I am Kolkata. So hopefully, uh, sometime in the future, I will be able to visit and uh, meet some of you possibly. Sure, um, sir. A chance, I would encourage you to strongly uh, take a look at my book. I think you'll have fun. It's not very expensive anyway. You should be able to get it. And, um, you know, Himadri actually posted a wonderful question. I'm going to pose it for all of you if he hasn't told you yet. Um, <laughs> no, I, have, I, I haven't. So, uh, so I'll, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll ask Professor Sarangi to pose the question. But before that, uh, for the uh, people who are joining in, I've actually read this book, uh, uh, The Economics of Small Things. And even though I'm from the economics background, I can uh, very well vouch for people even, I mean, remotely connected to economics. They will love this book just for the lucidity with which it has been written. And for many of you who might have actually found your microeconomics classes difficult to grasp, this is the first uh, book that you should buy uh, in the near future. And I, I actually loved reading it. And uh, Professor Arangi actually has a website where he asks uh, for uh, such questions where, uh, wherein, uh, I mean, you, uh, it's based on a daily, a daily life events. And I happen to contribute uh, to one of them. And Professor Sarang would be, I mean, I'd be uh, happy if Professor Sarang. I will tell you the question, but I'll not give you the answer. You have to go read <laughs> the answer. But let me tell you, it's a brilliant question, okay? So here is Himadri's question. He says, you know, we go to the vegetable seller or we go to the sweet shop and say, is it fresh? He's never going to say no. You know, he's always going to say fresh. Yes, it's fresh. So why do we ask this question? I think this is a brilliant question. I've given a long answer on the website. I've considered all the different possibilities. So go check it out. And, you know, this is the kind of spirit, this is the kind of thing that drives the book. So I hope you'll get a chance to read the book and have fun. Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much again, uh, Professor Sarangi, for joining us and uh, hope to see you in physical terms in the future. All right. Thank you all. It was thank uh, you, fun. Thank you all. Thank Good you. luck. Good luck with Thank your you. work. Thank you, sir. Take care. Stay safe.